Today I want to share with you how to make whole wheat Irish soda bread. And I also want to share more favorite St. Patrick's Day recipes. Hi sweet friends, I'm Mary and welcome to Mary's Nest where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient dense foods like bone broth, ferment, sourdough and more. So if you enjoy learning about those things consider subscribing to my channel and don't forget to click on the little notification bell below that'll let you know every time I upload a new video. Well first I want to wish you a very happy St. Patrick's Day coming up this March 17th. Now first I want to show you how to make this whole wheat Irish soda bread. Then I want to share more recipes with you that are perfect for St. Patrick's Day. I want to share with you how to make corned beef and cabbage. And I show you how to make this in both the Instant Pot and on the stove top. So either way it's going to come out perfect every time. Now keep in mind, corned beef and cabbage is not an Irish dish, it's actually quintessentially an American dish. But corned beef and cabbage is a dish that was developed by Irish immigrants living here in the United States. And now it's widely eaten here when we celebrate St. Patrick's Day. Now in addition to this whole wheat Irish soda bread and the corned beef and cabbage, I'm also going to share with you how to make an Irish apple cake, which will be perfect for dessert and it'll completely round out your St. Patrick's Day meal. Now we'll go over the ingredients for this whole wheat Irish soda bread, but you don't need to write anything down. If you open the description underneath this video, there'll be a link that'll say recipe. If you click on that, it'll take you over to my website, Mary's Nest, same name as my YouTube channel, and you can read the recipe online or you can print it out. And depending what device you're watching this video on, you can open the description under this video by clicking on the word show more or the little down arrow to the right of the title of this video. Now the first ingredient that you're going to need is flour. And you're going to need a total of about four to four and a half cups of flour. And of that total, you want three cups to be a whole wheat flour. Now you can just use the regular whole wheat flour that you buy from the grocery store, or you can use any of the ancient whole wheat flours like einkorn or spelt. For the remaining one and a half cups of flour, you're simply going to want to use an all-purpose flour. Now what I've got here are whole spelt berries. And as I mentioned earlier, spelt, not unlike einkorn, are ancient wheats. And I'm going to grind these into whole spelt flour. But don't worry if you don't have whole wheat berries or whole spelt berries or whole einkorn berries, whatever the case may be, and you're just starting with the whole grain flour, that's fine. But I find when it comes to whole grain flours, if you have the ability to grind them fresh, they're really wonderful. And these are also sprouted spelt berries. And if you would like to learn how to sprout your whole grain, if you have whole grain, I have a video where I show you how to do that. And I walk you through the process step by step to how to soak it, sprout it, dry it, and then grind it into flour. And it's actually very easy to sprout whole grains. Most of the work is on the part of the whole grain. So if that's something that you want to learn how to do, be sure to check in the description below where I'll put a link to the video where I show you how to do that. And I'll also link to it in the iCards. Now sprouting whole grains isn't necessary, uh, but if you've been with me a while, you've probably heard me talk about phytic acid, which is one of the anti-nutrients that are in whole grain. And it's not something that I worry too much about when I'm making some type of bread where I'm using a sourdough starter because that helps deactivate some of the phytic acid. But when I'm making a quick bread, I do like to use sprouted flour as opposed to unsprouted flour. Now, that's really very much a personal choice because phytic acid, although it does contain some anti-nutrients that does make it a little more difficult for, it, for us to digest and a little more difficult for us to uh, absorb certain nutrients, it also is an antioxidant, so it has both a good and a bad side. Uh, so don't worry if uh, sprouting flour is not something that you're considering doing. Uh, if you find you digest it fine and you don't have any trouble with it, uh, then definitely just use the whole wheat flour uh, that you buy from the grocery store. Or uh, if you are grinding, you know, any einkorn or spelt or other uh, ancient grain is fine to use. Now a cup of whole grain yields approximately a cup and a half of flour. So I'm going to grind enough grain to get what I need to make this bread. And if I have a little left over, no problem. I'm just going to pop it in my freezer. It'll stay fresh and I'll keep it there for another baking project. 
Now the grinder I'm using is a mock mill 100. This is the smaller version of the mock mill. I am so pleased with this. I purchased this myself and because I find that it works so well, I contacted the mock mill company and asked them if they could provide me with a discount coupon code for you if this was something that interested you as well. So be sure to check the description below for that coupon code and it applies to not only the various mock mills they, sh they sell, it also applies to anything else they sell including uh, ancient whole grains like einkorn and spelt. Now the mock mill has settings from 1 to 10 depending on how coarse or how fine you want your grain. I like to just grind most of my grain on number 5. I find that it's just an all-purpose grain or an all-purpose grind <laughs> that works perfect for most of my baking. So I'm going to just start grinding this and you'll hear it's not too loud but we'll get started. Now I've got all my whole spelt berries ground into flour and what I'm going to do is take about a cup of this and I'm going to start sifting it. And the reason that I'm doing that is as I said in the beginning of the recipe, you're going to need three cups of whole grain flour, but you're going to also need one and a half cups of all purpose flour. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sift out, I'm going to take one cup and I'm going to sift out as much bran and germ from that one cup as I can to try to make a spelt all purpose flour. And you can use a little mesh strainer like this or if you want to get it even finer, you can use an actual baker sift. And these are very common. I'll uh, put a link in the description below. They're, com they're very common and very reasonable. And these have a tighter mesh than just a regular strainer. Uh, and you can sift out even more bran and germ. But I'll do my best with this because I think most people have a strainer. And never feel bad about sifting out a little bit of the bran and germ or adding in a little bit of all-purpose flour or bread flour uh, whenever you're baking something. And the reason is this was a very common practice done by our ancestors because they knew if they sifted out a little bit of the bran and the germ, it would make a lighter bread and one that was a little easier to digest and more pleasant to the palate but you've still got plenty of nutrition in your three cups of whole grain flour, so you really don't need to worry. So this is some of the bran and the germ that I'm sifting out of my one cup of whole grain flour, and I'm just gonna keep going ahead and sifting that to get out as much as I can. Now when I've shown you how to do this in the past, some of you have asked me, well, what should you do with the bran or the germ? You don't wanna throw it out, and I don't blame you. There's no need to throw it out. You can put it in your freezer and save it, and then you can use it as an ingredient to add in when you make bran muffins or a homemade bran cereal. Now the first thing you want to do before we start mixing up our dough is to preheat your oven to 425 degrees Fahrenheit. And I believe that's about 218 degrees Celsius. And the next thing you're going to want to do is get a baking sheet. And I've just put down a piece of parchment paper here. You could put aluminum foil or you could just give it a little greasing and a little dusting with flour. Now other options if you don't have a baking sheet are to use a cake pan or a cast iron frying pan, anything that you can put your dough in and then put it into the oven to bake. Now the first thing that we're going to do is add our three cups of whole grain flour. In my case, I've got the whole grain spelt flour here and we're going to go ahead and add that to our mixing bowl. You want a nice large mixing bowl. And next you want to go ahead and add in your one and a half cups of all-purpose flour or bread flour or in my case the sifted flour. And I, wouldn't, I went ahead and sifted more flour so I would have the one and a half cups. Alrighty, then you just want to go and whisk these together to get them nicely incorporated. And then we're going to add three ingredients. We've got salt, one teaspoon. We've got baking soda, one teaspoon. And then what I've got here is a whole sweetener. It's called sucanat, and that's one tablespoon. Now, depending on where you are on transitioning from a processed foods kitchen to a traditional foods kitchen, you may just have white sugar in your kitchen, and that's fine. You can definitely use that. But if you are using whole sweeteners, you can definitely use Sucanat. It just stands for sugarcane natural, and it's simply the dried sugarcane juice. Uh, you could also use maple sugar. You could use uh, date sugar, uh, coconut sugar. Any of those would work. 
And I know that whenever I use sugar or some form of sweetener, many of you ask me, can it be left out? And yes, this is sort of a little special edition, adding in a little bit of sugar. Uh, I'm not really sure that it's traditional uh, to the original uh, whole wheat Irish soda breads or brown Irish soda bread as they're known. So if you want to leave this out, you certainly can. So let's go ahead and, and go ahead and get our salt in here. And we got our baking soda. That's the leavening agent for an Irish soda bread. And then we'll put in our little bit of sweetener. And then I'm just going to give this a good mix around to get everything incorporated. We want to make sure that baking soda and the salt are really well mixed with the flour. Now let's talk about some of the other ingredients for a minute. Traditionally, an Irish soda bread, whether made with an all-purpose flour or a whole grain flour, generally didn't have a lot of additions. It usually was the baking soda, the salt, uh, the flour, and then some sort of soured milk, uh, whether you know it was milk that had actually soured or buttermilk. And that's basically all that was used to make this quick bread. It was a very simple, um, very uh, country cooking type bread. Now, soda breads over time have been somewhat added to and modified to make them even a little more tasty and delicious. And sometimes people will add some butter, and then that's all. Other times people will add an egg, and that's all. And then sometimes people will add butter and an egg. So today I'm going to try to make this as delicious as possible, and we'll use butter and an egg. Now what you're going to want is four tablespoons of butter. And of course I'm using an Irish butter. I'm using Kerrygold butter. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to put this into our flour. And this is, uh, it's kind of room temperature, we're not super soft yet, but it's getting there. And what we're going to do is, as I said, put this in our flour and we're going to mix the butter in until we get a very crumbly sand-like mixture. Now you'll know when you have all the flour and butter mixed in thoroughly together because you'll be able to take a clump, squeeze it in your hand, it'll kind of stay together like damp sand, and then it'll easily fall apart once you just give it a little crush. Now, if you want to add any dried fruit to this Irish soda bread, this is the time to do it. And I'm going to add in currants, which is somewhat traditional. Uh, you can also use raisins as well. But I like currants because they're a little smaller, and I, it's also what I have. So I'm going to sprinkle those in. And the reason you want to put those in now and get them well dusted in the flour is because if they have flour on them, they will... Uh, be disseminated more evenly through your uh, Irish soda bread as opposed to just all sinking to the bottom. Now I mentioned earlier that traditionally some sort of sour milk was used and what I've got here is buttermilk but don't worry if you don't have buttermilk. If you have regular milk any type of regular milk will do whole milk, uh, part skim, all skim or you know, fat free whatever they call it today but whatever the case may be you can add a little lemon juice or a little vinegar about a tablespoon uh, to this cup and three quarters and mix it around a little, let it sit for a bit, and it'll curdle and turn it into a sour milk or a substitute buttermilk. And it's this sour milk or buttermilk that really helps make the Irish soda bread very tender. Uh, buttermilk and sour milk in general make any baked good very tender. It makes cakes tender and quick breads tender, but if you don't have it, don't worry. Say you've got milk but you have no way to sour it, you can go ahead and use milk. And depending on what type of milk you use, if you use a whole milk, it's going to make for a richer soda bread. If you use a fat-free milk, it's going to make for a less rich soda bread. And for those of you who like to keep things dairy-free, you can use one of the alternate milks. But it does change the taste and the texture slightly, so you just want to be aware of that. And yes, in a pinch, you can also use water. But water is going to make a very basic, very simple soda bread. Now I'm just going to go ahead and crack my egg in here. I just want to make sure that it's a good fresh egg. Yes, it looks good. And then I'm going to go ahead and add my egg to my buttermilk. 
and I'm going to give it a little whisk around before we add it to our dry ingredients. Now all you want to do is make a little well in the middle of all your dry ingredients and we're going to go ahead and add in our wet, our one and three quarter cups of buttermilk mixed with our egg. Next, once you get your wet ingredients poured in with your dry, you want to take your hand, clean hand, and you just want to start, have it kind of an open claw kind of shape, and you just want to start uh, incorporating the dry ingredients into the wet until you get a nice dough. Now once you get all of the dry ingredients incorporated with the wet, it may be a little sticky, which you're seeing with my, mine is a little sticky. So all I'm going to do is take a little flour and put it on my hand, not too much, just a little bit here. I'm just going to incorporate a little more flour just to get this dry and ready to put on our baking sheet. And you, you don't want to knead this. You really don't want to overwork this. You just want to get it dry enough to be handled. Well, I've got it into the shape of a bowl. It's not very sticky anymore. We've more or less cleaned the bowl and we're ready to transfer it to our baking sheet. Now I'm just going to flour my hands a little and just flatten this down ever so gently. Now the next thing that you want to do is make a nice cross on top of your Irish soda bread. And I've got a serrated knife here, that works very well, but any sharp knife will do. And as my Irish father learned from his Irish mother, my grandmother Mary, you've got to take the tip of a sharp knife and then you've got to poke four holes in each quadrant of your Irish soda bread. And that lets out the fairies and that'll guarantee that this will be delicious. Now we're going to go ahead and pop this into our preheated oven. It's going to take about 35 to 45 minutes to bake thoroughly. You'll know that it's done because it'll be a beautiful golden brown. And if you pick it up and tap on the bottom, it'll sound well baked and hollow. Now while that soda bread is baking, I want to talk about those other recipes to help you round out your St. Patrick's Day dinner. Now I have one video where I show you how to make a complete corned beef and cabbage dinner using the Instant Pot. And I share with you a couple of tips and tricks so that you don't disintegrate the potatoes or make the cabbage super mushy. It's really going to come out great. So if you have an Instant Pot and you want to do your corned beef and cabbage in the Instant Pot, be sure to check that uh, link to the video in the description below and I'll also put it in the iCards. Now if you don't have an Instant Pot and you want to make your corned beef and cabbage on the stovetop, I have a video where I show you how to do that as well. And I'll be sure to link to, the, to that in the description below and I'll also put that in the iCards. And in doing it on the stovetop, I also share some tips and tricks so that your potatoes won't disintegrate or disappear and that your cabbage will come out perfect every time. And of course, the corned beef in both of those recipes is going to be delicious. It's going to be tender and I share with you how to slice it correctly. Well, first, which type of corned beef uh, to purchase and then I show, show you how to slice it so that it comes out perfect in beautiful slices and not stringy. And then to round out your meal for dessert, I share with you a recipe for an Irish apple cake. Now my take on the Irish apple cake may be a little different than some of the traditional Irish apple cakes that you've seen in the past, but I think you're going to really like it. And the reason that it's a little different is that my Irish father liked apple cake very much, but my Italian mother had not heard of it and didn't know how to make it. And my father didn't have a recipe or anything for it, he just remembered it from his youth. So my mother experimented and came up with her version, her Italian version of an Irish apple cake. And it's always been very, it always comes out very delicious and I think you'll enjoy it too. And it has a wonderful crisp topping. So I'll also put a link to that video in the description below and in the iCards. And I think that's going to round out your meal beautifully. And it also makes great leftovers with coffee uh, the next morning for breakfast. Now if traditional Irish cooking is something that interests you, I highly recommend looking for cookbooks by Darina Allen. And I hope I'm saying her first name correctly, but she just has wonderful cookbooks. Now this one is a little old, I believe there are newer editions of this, uh, but Darina is the owner of the Ballymaloo, if I'm saying that correctly, the Ballymaloo Cooking School in Ireland. And she just has wonderful, wonderful, really traditional Irish recipes. And you can never go wrong with any cookbook by her. And her daughter has them. She has cookbooks as well. 
and I believe her granddaughter even has cookbooks. Uh, so you can't, you can't go wrong with anything from the Allen family when it comes to uh, traditional Irish cooking and traditional Irish recipes. And then this book, The Farmette Cookbook, this is such a sweet cookbook. And the author is such a sweet girl. She's actually an American and she married an Irish farmer and moved to Ireland. So she has quite a story. And she has some wonderful recipes in here. So definitely uh, look for this, the, the Farmet cookbook. And Farmet, she explains, is like the farmer's wife uh, on an Irish farm, something like that. It's very cute. You have to read her story and it's quite adorable. But she has some uh, wonderful uh, recipes in here. I'll just take a quick look while we're waiting for that soda bread to finish up. But uh, she, first of all, uh, it's really, as I said, it's a lot more than a cookbook because it's about her story. And she says, recipes and adventures from my life on an Irish farm. And it's cute because she breaks things down. She has a chapter called The Bread Box, where she talks about some different Irish breads. Potatoes, of course, she devotes a whole chapter just to potatoes. And then from the sea, Ireland being uh, surrounded by water, she's got some wonderful uh, recipes, uh, uh, fish-based recipes. And then she has country suppers, Sunday lunch. Uh, it's just delightful. And then she's got some recipes, a chapter she calls Country Kids. So definitely look for this uh, in your travels, the Farmette cookbook. It's a, it's a lovely cookbook and a very sweet story, a very sweet love story. Well, look at this glorious whole wheat Irish soda bread. It just came beautiful. Now, I checked it at 35 minutes, but it wasn't quite fully baked, so I let it go for the whole 45 minutes. But everybody's oven's different, so check yours at 35 minutes and see how it's doing. Now, if you're worried that it's getting too brown on top, but it's still not quite baked and you've got to go for those full 45 minutes, don't worry, you can just tent it with a little aluminum foil, let it cook, and it won't brown anymore on top. Now what I'm going to do is transfer this Irish soda bread to my cooling rack and let it just cool for a few minutes. Uh, you want to just give it a few minutes before you slice it. You can definitely serve it warm, uh, but give it about 10 minutes to cool. You can definitely serve it at room temperature. That's fine too. And if you want to maybe serve it the next day and it's been refrigerated, just slice it and you can warm it in the oven or you can stick it in your toaster and then some nice hot butter on top and it'll be scrumptious. So let's have this cool a bit and then we'll slice it. We'll look at it inside and we'll give it a taste. Well, this is cooled about 10 minutes, so we're all ready to slice it. And if you've ever wondered why you put a cross on the top of Irish soda bread is because one, the reasons are actually twofold. One is that the cross harkens back to the significance of the Catholic faith to the Irish people. And secondly, it allows for the bread to cook thoroughly in the middle, which was very important, especially when this may have just been being cooked in a fireplace over peat in a little Irish cottage. And this way they knew that it would cook thoroughly. Now I'm just going to use my serrated knife again, but any knife that you have should work well. Oh, so listen to that. It sounds good. Well, this looks lovely. Oh, and the aroma just smells delicious. Let's slice a piece off here and we'll put some butter on it and give it a taste. I've got a good slathering of Irish butter here. Mmm. <laughs> mmm. Oh, that's delicious. Mm. And I love it with the currants. They add a wonderful level of sweetness. Well, hopefully I made St. Patrick proud. Now, if you'd like more Irish recipes, including those corned beef and cabbage recipes I mentioned, plus the apple cake, plus a couple more takes on Irish soda bread, be sure to click on this video over here where I have the full playlist. And I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country kitchen. Happy St. Patrick's, <laughs> Patrick's Day and love and God bless.